Hey, good morning. Good morning, DSW family. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's another Friday morning that we are here just magnifying the name of the Lord God Almighty. He is a wonderful and worthy God to be praised. Amen. Blessed Jesus. Blessed Jesus. We're going on a journey this morning. And I just want you to, you know, to really wake up and freshen up and get some persons in your household to, you know, to, to, to come and to listen to the broadcast live while we are doing it right now it's listen god has been so good to us right that while we were sleeping he kept the enemy at bay you could have died in your sleep last night but he said no i'm going to allow this one to live i'm going to allow you to live because there is still some more praises that can come out of this one there is still some glory that i can get out of this one so he allowed you and i this morning to live so while we are still in the land of the living, we're going to be praising the name of the Lord, right? And we're going to be remembering the good that God has done for us. But while you're doing all of that, I want you to remember to please like and share the broadcast and send it as far and as wide as possible. Share it as a gift. Give it to somebody this morning as a gift on this Good Friday um, day that we are experiencing at this time it is a blessing to be alive the irrespective of how troublesome the time is irrespective of how difficult some things are in our lives it is still a blessing to be alive because there are some mighty god who are not in a position to experience what you are going through right now they are not they don't have the privilege Almighty God, of looking forward to, mighty God, some kind of deliverance, some kind of better day to come because they are in the grave, mighty God. But you are alive this morning and you can still continue to glorify the awesome and mighty what wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I see the, you know, the, 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 the comments coming in. Blessed Jesus, happy Good Friday. Happy Good Friday, everyone. Happy Good Friday. Yes, and it is almost like a prophecy this morning because we're saying happy Good Friday. And we all know the story about Good Friday. And so I hope that at the end of the day, it will have been a good Friday for you, right? It will be a good Friday for you. It's the very start of the day, but I know it's going to be a good Friday. Why? Because we're starting it off just right with praising the name of the Lord. Mighty God, mighty God, mighty God. Blessed Jesus. We're just going to, you know, we're just going to pray at this time and then we'll be guided by the Holy Spirit as he leads us going forward. Blessed Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning, oh God, for life and all that you have already done and what you are continuing to do despite our weaknesses, despite our challenges, despite, mighty God, our lack of understanding and lack of worship unto you, O oh God, our Father. But Father God, we take time out this morning just to reflect and remember the sacrifice that you have made on that cross at Calvary. Oh, you gave up everything you had. You gave up your body. You gave up everything that you mighty God, that everyone in this earth born of a woman may have the opportunity to be saved, to be rescued, to be brought back from sin. And so this morning, oh God, as we pause to reflect, God help us to analyze and to internalize and to accept and to hold on to your word. Oh God, that you, Jesus, love us so much. God, that you give us, mighty God, your only son, that he who knew no sin would become sin for the entire world. That we who were subject to judgment, who were subject to punishment, who were subject to suffer as a result of our sin nature, mighty God, and the things that we have already done, 
even so mighty god you look beyond oh god our oh god our inability to rescue ourselves and you stepped in our place you were the scapegoat mighty god that received god's judgment oh blessed jesus and mighty god you died for our sins that we might have life and have it more abundantly so god this morning god we refuse to be ungrateful but we choose rather to remember and to reflect and commemorate god the things that you have done and to give you praise mighty god for those things father god i pray god even for healing for your people god that those who are still struggling those who are still mighty god under the whip those who are still mighty god wondering how they are going to get out how they are going to break free blessed jesus god that you will deliver them as we worship you right now god remember your people lord jesus oh god as they mighty god call on your name blessed jesus blessed jesus as they call in the name mighty god remember blessed jesus them right now oh mighty god and send help for your people blessed jesus mighty god god father remember stephanie james mighty god who is asking for prayer for her daughter-in-law mighty god as she's going to be hospitalized to have her baby but god i know lord jesus that you are able God, there is no situation that you can fix. So, we mighty God, we ask you, God, to cover her under your wings right now. Mighty God, that she will, mighty God, deliver, mighty God, a healthy child. And she herself, mighty God, will be healthy and strong. Oh, God, I pray, Lord Jesus, oh, God, right now for every single one and our families right now who is listening to this broadcast, whether live or delayed, blessed Jesus, will be blessed. Father God, have your perfect will and way as we lift you up right now in jesus name amen blessed jesus good morning again good morning and greetings greetings blessed jesus i was just um you know I, i'm just happy this morning to know that i'm still in the land of the living you know when i woke up this morning i i woke up and i look at my hands and i look at my feet and i was able to to move them around i was able to to lift my legs i was able to put on my shirt i was able to comb my ear and i said to myself listen this is enough reason to give god thanks because some don't have that kind of privilege sometimes we take some things for granted because it's always happening or nothing um you know really negative has been happening in in, in recent times so we take the blessings we take the goodness of god for granted oh you know it, it's a must it's a given that we have to wake up and, and and are physically able to do these things because we have been doing it for so long we take it for granted but it's only because of the grace it's only because of god's favor and mercy why we are still privileged enough to do these things as simple as they may seem to some as simple as it may seem it's still a blessing right there let me also use the opportunity right now just to greet um bishop and lady curry this morning this friday morning this awesome and wonderful friday morning let me just greet them in the mighty and exalted name of our lord and savior jesus christ greetings one a wonder to a wonderful woman and man of the living god who have been staying in the gospel and pushing the gospel of jesus christ forward and i appreciate the sacrifice and the effort that they have made over the years to ensure that the gospel mighty god continues to travel and get into the lives of those who need to hear it blessed jesus let me also greet um assistant pastor um onil pusey blessed jesus as you know he is a, a man of God who just loves the Lord and wants to ensure that the Lord's word, you know, gets out there and reaches into the dark places that those who sit in darkness 
will receive light. And let me also greet the entire DSW team from my wife, Renee Johnson, to all the other um, team members of the, the this, this award-winning program, because it is an award-winning program this morning. Blessed Jesus, they all make tremendous sacrifices to be on this program on the respective mornings that they are assigned. And so I want to use the opportunity to, to, to big them up as well for those things that they have, uh, have already done and are still committing themselves to doing. Certainly, our God is able to bless and to deliver. Blessed Jesus. So this morning, I am grateful to what the Lord has done. Blessed Jesus. Are you grateful this morning? Are you thankful this morning for Calvary and for the things that Jesus Christ has done for us? Are you thankful this morning? Blessed Jesus. Let's go ahead and just put a praise in mighty God, the chat right now. Whichever platform that you're reviewing from, just go ahead and put a praise in the chat right now, mighty God, indicating that you are grateful for what the Lord has already done and what he's still doing in your life. Blessed Jesus. Blessed Jesus. Blessed Jesus. Somebody, mighty God, just lift your hands, oh God, and praise the name of the Lord from the rising of the sun unto the very going down of the same our God is worthy to be praised. Blessed Jesus, the heavens declare his glory, mighty God. The heavens, mighty God, declare the glory of Jesus Christ. Mighty God, yes, and everything therein, mighty God, worship the living God. Everything worships God, blessed Jesus. Though there are many things that men, mighty God, call God, Yet still, there is only one God, only one God and Father of all. There is only one God, and we worship this one God this morning and forevermore because he is mighty God, the only God to be worshipped. Amen? Blessed Jesus. Please use the opportunity again to like and share the broadcast as we go forward. Blessed Jesus. I'm going to use the opportunity right now just to read a few verses of scripture in your hearing. I want to, you know, build context for, you know, what I want to say hereafter. But this particular um, chapter of scripture is fairly long. So I may not be able to go through all of the, um, all of it, but I'll go through as much as I can. And it is taken from, the book of St. Matthew, chapter 27. St. Matthew, chapter 27. And I think I'm going to read up to about um, verse... Um, about verse uh, 51 or somewhere about. It's fairly low. All right? So please bear with me because I want to build context. I want it to be fresh in your mind. All right? All right, so it reads thus, St. Matthew chapter 27. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had um, bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, it is not lawful for us to put them into the, usual, in the, into the treasury because it is the price of blood. And they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore, that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, and they took the, the 30 pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they 
of the children of Israel did value and gave them for the potter's field and the Lord appointed me. And Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him saying, art thou king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests and the elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him to never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. Now at, the, now at that feast, the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will he that I release unto you? Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For they knew, for he knew that for envy they had delivered him. And when he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have, have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitude. Mighty God, can you imagine that? But the chief priests and the, and the elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, whether of the twain will he that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said, saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. <laughs> and the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather that a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See he to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be upon us, mighty God, and our children. Look carefully. I'm going to read this one more time. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be upon us and our children. Mighty God. Then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on, put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plotted a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head and after that they mocked him they took the robe off from him and put it on put on his own raiment on him and led him away to be crucified and as they came out they found a man of Cyrene Simon by name him they compelled to bear his cross and when they were come unto a place called Golgotha um, that is to say a place of skull they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall my god and when he had tasted thereof he would not drink and they crucified him and parted his garment casting lots that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet they parted my garments among them and upon my vesture did they cast lots and sitting down they watched him there and set and set over his head is accusation written this is jesus the king of the jews then were there two thieves crucified with him one on the right hand and the other on the left and they that passed and they that passed by reviled him wagging their heads and saying thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days save thyself 
for, sorry, if thou be the son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, he saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him come, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now. If he will deliver, if he will have him, for he said, I am the son of God. The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in, in his teeth. Now, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my father, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there, when they heard that, said, this man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Um, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, he lit up the ghost. And I'm going to stop at verse 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. Just going to pause there at this moment in time. Blessed Jesus, there ends a portion of God's holy and mighty words. And may the Lord, mighty God, richest blessings be poured out upon us, mighty God, this morning as we listen and as we allow this word to settle in our spirits. Amen. Blessed Jesus. So this morning, having read that fairly lengthy passage from the book of St. Matthew, chapter 27, I just want to, you know, to speak a little on the topic, the agony of the cross, the agony of the cross. All right. And as I read that particular passage of scripture, it reminded me and puts me in a place where I just want to rejoice. Because when I looked at the depth of the suffering of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and how important this particular activity was for all of mankind. This wasn't a regular activity. There are some things that you know, happens around the world, maybe once per year, maybe once in an entire lifetime, that is not, noteworthy, right? It is notable. It is something to take note of. It is something that we may even celebrate. But not, no, but there is no other activity that has ever taken place that has such tremendous implications for mankind on a whole going forward. As much as mankind has been building nuclear weapons, which has the potential to destroy the earth. There is no such activity in the earth that has a greater implication for mankind than this event of Jesus' crucifixion. Yes, it's the most pivotal of historic moments, the death and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the, the account from Matthew brings us face to face with the brutality and the reality of the sufferings of Jesus Christ. And that is what we want to talk about this morning in terms of the topic, the agony of the cross. But I want us to understand, though, that they were that the, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is one thing. But before that faithful day of the crucifixion, I want us to understand that there were a series of activities that led to that particular day of Jesus being crucified on a cross. And so let's get into a little bit about the events that led to Jesus going to the cross. So at the time of Jesus' public ministry, 
saints of the living God. The Roman government, the, the Romans were occupying the territory of Israel and Judah. They were occupying the place. They were, the, they were the, like the superpower of the day. And they had defeated God's people and ruling over them. And they occupied that territory. So what they did when they, when, when they go into a territory and they defeat a country, they would set up their own governance structure. So they will put certain leaders, certain influential and powerful leaders in certain strategic positions to help to keep peace. And not just to keep peace, but to help, to, 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 to help the Roman governor, the, the Caesar, to, 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 um, to maintain this as a territory or a tributary to the Roman Empire. So the Roman, the Roman had an empire that they were building. And so in order to have that empire um, strong and healthy and surviving, then they had to set up strategic individuals in various countries and various territory and then rule over those particular areas. And as such, that was what was actually happening here. So the Roman governor, so the Romans or Caesar had set up governors throughout um, his territory. And one such governor was Pontius Pilate. And so they would set up these governors to help to control the people, right? To help to give them leadership, to help to ensure that they paid their, their, their tributes and their taxes to the Roman government, ensure that there was no rebellion, to ensure that things were running just right, so that such that the Roman Empire would continue to get fat and rich out of the, the, the extortion and out of the, the, the cruel treatment of the people. So they did that kind of thing. And Pontius Pilate was one such ruler that the Roman government had set up. But not only did they set up political leaders, they also set up their own puppet religious leaders as well, of which Caiaphas was one of those, the high priest. So what the Roman government did was to remove the original high priest, yes? And after removing them, then they set up their own religious leader to, to guide the people because they wanted somebody that they can control. And we understand that concept, right? We, we understand the concept of control over people. We want to control certain activities. So we set up people that we know and are yes men, right? Nobody's going to come to, to offer. We don't want anybody in any strategic position that is going to offer us any kind of resistance. It's going to back talk us. It's going to tell us, listen, what you're planning to do is not good. And they don't want that. They want someone that anything that they say will agree to it and such. They remove the high priest and set up Caiaphas as the high priest because they wanted their own religious puppet and that's what Caiaphas was. Now, why am I talking about Caiaphas and these kind of activities before we get to the cross? It's important to understand these things because the Roman government needed to keep peace, but peace could not be kept just like that because they needed somebody who, not from a political perspective, no, who could use the armies to, to, to inflict fear upon the people, right? To cause them to, to not to rebel. But they also realized that just brute force alone would not work against these people. Just to use brute force, meaning the army and to fight them and to kill them alone would not be enough. So they had to set up a political system as well that they could use to kind of calm the people. Someone who understand the, 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 the various... Um, Old Testament prophecies and scriptures and, you know, and the law and, and, and how to get the people to, to listen to him. So they set up Caiaphas as a puppet kind of religious government. <laughs> yes. Because they wanted that kind of rule over the people. And they wanted that control. So Caiaphas was, uh, he, he, he was a Sadducee. And as one preacher once said some years ago, that a Pharisee is someone that is too sad to see. <laughs> he was of the religious set that is called a Sadducee. So apart from the, the, the Pharisees, there were also a religious set that is called a Sadducee. And, you know, I told you that the preacher said 
that they were too sad to see. He also went on to say that the Pharisees were a set of religious people who were too far to see. So they are Pharisees, right? But nevertheless, so this man was the high priest of the day. And it was, that was the ruling um, high priest at this time. Blessed Jesus. So Caiaphas was also the leader of the Sahedrin council. So the Jews had a council that of religious leaders that would come together to meet to discuss matters concerning their, 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 their Jewish committee or their Jewish community rather. And Caiaphas was the leader of that. So when news got out, because news got out of all the things that Jesus was actually doing. Now we're leading up to the crucifixion now. So bear with me, right? So when news got out that Jesus was going around the country, healing and working miracles, the Jewish leaders were angry. They were upset. Why? Because they thought that what Jesus was doing was going to upset the, the apple cart. It was going to upset the Romans. And they didn't want the Romans to be upset with them and to destroy the nation. So what, they, so, so what happened now, because they were upset, especially after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. They were mad that Lazarus was raised from the dead. They were upset and they called the council, the Sanhedrin council together. And Caiaphas provide, um, pre prevailed over that particular council. And they all gave their arguments as to what they have heard about this man Jesus and the things that he was doing. And Caiaphas was the one who stood up in their midst and said, listen, it is needful that this one man be killed for the nation. This one man, Jesus, be killed for the things that he has been doing. That the nation could be saved. It was Caiaphas who instigated and initiated that Jesus Christ first should be killed. Caiaphas, this puppet religious high priest. At this council of, of the Sahedrin. He initiated and instigated that among the, the most influential religious leaders among the Jews. And he told them that, listen, let us kill this man that our nation will be saved because we are fearful that the Roman government will come in with their armed forces and just wipe us out as a nation. So it is better if we get rid of this Jesus that is creating this, this havoc among the people by bringing this new thing that we're not aware of or this new thing that we don't like and raising people from the dead. We don't like it and we think that the Roman government is going to be upset as well. So let's get rid of him. Caiaphas instigated that. Now, after he instigated that, according to the book of John chapter 11, it tells us, it chronicles all of this that I'm telling you right now. John chapter 11, you can find it in your Bibles and read it from verse 45 through to about verse 54, what happened in that um, council and the things that were said in that council because John wrote it down. And we believe the testimony of John that these are the things that were discussed in that particular council. So from that time, they, 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 they purposed in their heart that they would kill Jesus. Not realizing though that this is something that had to happen. All right. So I want us to understand, though, after after that being set up like that. All right. I want us to understand that they choose to use crucifixion as a punishment for this man, Jesus. No crucifixion was a very common and brutal form of corporal punishment among many nations, not just the Roman Empire. It is something that the Roman Empire adopted, but it wasn't something that was unique to the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire saw other nations doing it and adopted it into their culture or into their, into their way or as a method of um, killing individuals that, that, that they believe are guilty of a particular type of crime. So they adopted it. But not only did they adopt crucifixion as a means of punishment or judgment against um, a criminal, they also perfected the act of crucifixion. 
they perfected it. So they looked carefully at it as to see how they can make improvements to this crucifixion. To why? Because they want to make sure that this was a very painful death that an individual would suffer. Yes? They want to make sure it was a very painful and difficult death an individual would suffer. So they adopted it as a viable means of judgment against criminals. All right? There were other methods, however, of, um, of executing a criminal in the days that were just very brutal and cruel to the bone. No, you would wonder, right? You would wonder. What happened to the human rights organization in those days, right? We were there. We were the human rights people to come out and say, listen, what is going on here? You can't do this. There was no such, there was no such thing, right? So there was nobody to offer any kind of resistance to what these people were doing, right? So they used to boil people in, 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 in hot water or tar or oil or some other liquid. Right? They would boil them so they would put a living individual into a big cauldron boiling with oil or water or some other liquid and allow them to die in that boiling liquid. Right, So that's another method of executing um, a, a, a criminal. Another way, of course, crucifixion that we're talking about, no, we're getting into a little bit more detail of. Right? Also, there was another method that they used as well. And this other method sounds just as brutal and as evil as any other thing that we have heard, right? So what they did, or this method, is what they did was to take a dead body, an individual who's already dead, and their body is de decaying. So we know maggots is, has already taken up the body, and the flesh is falling from the bones of the person, right, who is dead. And they would tie that decaying body to a living person. So the person who they, want, who they want to kill because they're a criminal and they're punishing them. So they would tie that decaying body to the living person body and allow them, allow them to die that way. So of course you know, because the person, the, the body is decaying. Now all the worms and the maggots and the thing from the person who's, who's already dead will now come over into that body that is living. The living person is watching himself being eaten alive by the worms and the maggots and thing, and the person will die eventually because a decaying body is tied to them and there is nothing they could do to free themselves from that decaying body. So you can imagine that. And that's another method in which that they use to kill people mighty god but crucifixion is especially another method of before i get back to the crucifixion another method that they use was also called quartering in which they would take an individual and they would tie them with ropes and use horses and stretch them and pull them apart so they pull the left hand and rip it from the torso rip it from the body Pull the right hand and rip it from the body. Pull the left leg, rip it from the body. Pull the right leg and rip it from the body. They call it quartering. You know, like you're going to shop and you say you're buying a leg quarter. <laughs> you're buying a leg quarter. You're going to cut off that portion. That's what. They rip the person apart. They just tear you apart with the power of the horses. That's another method. But this time, they chose to use crucifixion as the method that they were going to use against this man, Jesus. And for what? Because Pilate did say that they knew, that they knew after questioning Jesus that it was just a matter of envy why they wanted this man dead. Envy, no. It wasn't because he committed any crime. It was just because of envy. They could not do the things that Jesus was doing. And they hated it. And they made up all kind of stories and all kind of things to tell people just to instigate some kind of fury and anger within people because of what Jesus was doing. All right? But crucifixion is not just about putting someone on the cross. Like I said, the Romans looked at the method that they, were, that they had adopted from another country of crucifixion and they perfected it. So the Romans decided to make this a more cruel act 
towards an individual guilty of a crime that they were going to punish, they would do a number of things before they put them on the cross. Yes, they would do a number of things to them. So they would, one, they would beat them. They would scourge them. That's what a scourging is, a beating. And that scourging is also a very cruel process. So there is a series of activities. So this scourging is a whipping. So they would take a whip of um, built of several strands, right? And then they would, of course, at the very end of the whip would be connected either um, animal teeth, which would be curved. So they would either file the animal teeth to make sure it's curved, right? So animal bone or teeth. Or they would take a piece of metal and they would bend that metal and they would sharpen that metal and attach it to the very end of the whip. <laughs> Mighty God, and it's made of several strands. And so when they whip you with that whip or when they whipped Jesus with that whip and it went over his back, understand that when, they, when it went over his back and they tried to pull it back, some of those metal or bone, animal bone or teeth would actually stick into the flesh. And when it stick into the flesh and they pulled it back, it ripped into Jesus' flesh, ripped into his back and, and caused some severe lacerations, cuts in his back, right? It would whip in, when it got into his back, the things would st get stuck and they would just dry it. And when they dry it, blood would just be coming out and you know, all this flesh being exposed. That's what Jesus was experiencing with the whipping. So they whipped him. <laughs> they give him 39 lashes because there was a fear that if you did 40, the individual would die. They would bleed out. Mighty God said so they, so they whipped him. And that was a very painful and difficult process in and of itself, by the way. So they whipped Jesus. And then not only did they whip him, so now Jesus was a bloody mess because he was beaten. Why? Because he was doing his father's business, because he was bringing people back from the dead. They hated the fact that Lazarus was brought back from the dead. They hated the fact that the blind, mighty God, received their sight. They hated the fact, mighty God, that people were receiving salvation. People were walking away from Judaism, which was the dominant religion at the time. They were walking out of Judaism and accepting something new that Jesus was bringing to the fore. They hated Jesus for doing his father's work. And so they decided now that they were going to crucify him as the chosen method. But a part of the crucifixion started with mighty to God the scourging because he was now a condemned criminal because he was brought to some puppet courts mighty God he stood before Caiaphas he stood before Pilate mighty God and both of them could not find any real thing mighty God that they could pin on Jesus you know sometimes mighty God our court system may not be as as sound as it ought to be and so all kind of corruption happening in the court system so it was these court system that jesus was brought to was a corrupt system but even so they still couldn't find anything that they could pin on this man yet still they wanted him dead not only did they wanted him dead mighty god the people said let his blood be upon us meaning the crowd of people that were saying to jesus a little earlier before this right Hosanna, Hosanna, mighty God. Blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord, you know. When he was going into Jerusalem on that donkey, and the people cut down palms and strayed them before him and were praising him, you know, Hosanna, Hosanna. Some of the very people that were doing that are the very ones who said to Pilate, after Pilate said, listen, I have tested this man. I have questioned this man. And I have found no fault in this man. And I'm, and I'm getting some water right now. And I'm going to wash my hands clean of this man's death. Why? Because this man is innocent. And the people say, listen, you think he's innocent, but we want him dead. So let his blood be upon us, our shoulders. And not just us, but also on our children. That is what they said. <laughs> Why? Because Caiaphas had already corrupted the minds of the people he corrupted the upper echelon mighty god of the religious leaders and they in turn also were used to corrupt the minds of the general populace of the jewish community 
to say, listen, when Pilate asks you, who do you want? Because of the culture or the custom that we have. When Pilate asks you, who do you want? We're going to tell him, not Jesus. We're going to tell him that we want somebody else, Barabbas. We don't want, we don't, we don't want Jesus to be released. We want him to be crucified. And it started at that council in the Sahedrin that Caiaphas first presented the argument let Jesus be crucified let Jesus be killed on behalf of the nation and it spread and it corrupted the minds of the people that is why I started there earlier so there is a method to the madness right so they scourged him and after beating him and he was a bloody mess and there was exposed flesh and blood was running all over he was like I said before a bloody mess then they dragged him, of course, they, you know, they, they dragged him and they, 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 um, they gave him the, the cross to carry. Now, there is a common misconception here. There is a common misconception here that, the, um, that Jesus carried the entire cross. But according to, if you were to look a little deeper into it, on the practice of crucifixion by the Jews, by the Romans, you would realize that, that is not true. Jesus didn't carry the full cross. He only carried the horizontal portion, the beam, the portion that he could put over his shoulder. That was the part that he carried. The other part, the, the, the vertical portion, was already in the ground at the place where he would be crucified. So it was already put in the ground, standing upright, just waiting for the horizontal portion and the victim to come, for him to be lifted, all right, and put there. So it wasn't the full cross that Jesus carried. And it has been circulating in our, in, our, in, our, in our assemblies for many, many years that Jesus carried the full cross. But that is not true. And even in the movies and on the TV, we see this, this individual acting like Jesus and carrying the full cross. But that is not true. In its truest sense, based on what the historians say and the, um, and the theologians, he carried only the horizontal portion. So he was beaten. And then this argument about Jesus um, carried the cross for 82 miles is another misconception. Now, let me ask you a question this morning, right? Just to debunk, debunk that argument. Can you walk 82 miles? You are healthy now. Nothing is wrong with your feet. Nothing is wrong. You are well hydrated. You are very healthy. Can you walk 82 miles? Chances are your, 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 your answer will be no. You cannot walk 82 miles. Then why do you think then a man who is beaten, losing rapid amount of blood, flesh exposed to the elements, walking in the very hot sun with the horizontal portion of the cross, yes, is able to walk 82 miles. Think about that for a moment. The victims of crucifixion were normally um, beaten and so on just outside of the city gates. They were crucified rather outside of the city gates. So it wasn't too far from where he was going to be crucified. So the distance is not 82 miles. As the song says, that song, you know, which, which makes it very popular, that Jesus walked 82 miles is not true. Go and check it out for yourself. Right? That's not true. Not true at all. All right. So outside of that, so they, 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 they scourged him. And he was walking now with the horizontal portion of the cross. All right. Now the Roman soldiers then mocked him you know, and said, King of the Jews. They call him King of the Jews. Mighty God. Not knowing that they were actually speaking the truth because he was the king of the Jews. But they thought that he was a joke. Something to just laugh about. You know, by clothing him in, in purple robe and, and say, Yo, so you say you're a king? All right, we're going to put on kingly garments on you. Right? So king in those days wear purple and, you know, scarlet and all of these kind of colors because it represents royalty. And they put a crown of thorns on his head. Now, I want you to understand this part of it, you know. When they talk about a crown of thorns, it's not, I don't know how you read the Bible. I don't know how you see the Bible. Maybe you look at it as though it is some kind of um, deeply um, religious 
text that is put up in the sky and you can't even understand it from your um experience or your understanding right but that is not true also when you talk about crown of thorns you know in jamaica we would say maca <laughs> yes some big maca they take that you know and they bend that thing they bent it and form a circular object though no of course you know the maca is still sticking out right i can imagine some of the persons who were who were plaiting that crown of thorns also suffered the consequences of handling those thorns meaning that they were pricked by the thorns themselves but even so they continued to do it and then they put it on jesus head. They, they they didn't just do this enough they didn't just rest it on his head in the saints of god they actually push it down on his head so if you push down that thing on the man's head what do you expect is going to happen it's going to rip into the, the man's skin and expose the material just below the surface of the skin right and it's going to cause blood to come out so you can imagine now by now when they put that crown when they push it down on his head his entire face not not only was his back blooded but now his face was now full of blood running down even into his eyes on his lips on his nose on his jaw was just full of blood because the the the, the, the maca in other words are the, the thorns was piercing into the man's skin in his head ripping apart mighty god even the material that was there ripping it and tearing it and this man had to still be walking with the with the horizontal portion of the cross with his back ripped apart beaten and blooded walking in the hot sun mighty god mighty god the thing that he suffered the agony of the cross i wanted to understand this morning how cruel crucifixion really was because sometimes when you read it, you don't take the time out to look into it, to understand what this thing really is. You understand that, yes, it's just a method of putting an individual on a cross. But you don't fully understand the depth at which this man suffered for you and I. That you and I would have life and have it abundantly. And yet still, despite all that Jesus had done, we refuse to praise him. We refuse to open our mouth and give God a praise. Because you don't even understand the things that he suffered for you and I this morning for the liberty that we have we don't even understand the things that he went through so they put the crown of thorns and he said yes and they mocked him and they buffeted him they, 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 you know Jamaica would say we thump or box him and say both you are king of the Jews yes yeah, I, I'm, I'm using our Jamaican language right both you are king of the Jews all this Yes, both your king of the king of which Jews? King of which Jews? Look at this. You're robed in royal colors, yes. But you're no king. You're no king. King of which Jews? We don't recognize you as king. We don't respect you as no king. We don't see you as any king. King which part? King for who? Certainly not for me. That's what. That's how they were ridicule, ridiculing Jesus. That's all they were doing. And they stripped him. After that, they stripped him of his clothing, you know. They, they took off the clothing that they had early, you know, that they early um, scourged him in. And they bound him fast with outstretched arms like this, you know, for him to carry the cross, you know, the cross beam. On which, of course, they would nail him to. So when it got to the place of the execution now, he was then stripped and then nailed to the cross. Yes? By his hands, they nailed his hands and they, you know, and they nailed his feet. They nailed his hands. And then they, 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 they put that inscription at the top of the cross. Because according to the, according to the custom or the method of crucifixion, <clears throat> for everyone who is being crucified, whatever it is that they're being crucified for, would have to go on the cross as them with them as well. So they would put that inscription that this man is a thief, or this man was a liar, or this man was you know a, a, re a rebellious person or whatever. So they would put it there to say this is why you're being crucified. And so he was being crucified for being king of the Jews. Huh? He was being crucified <laughs> and they put the inscription there because he was 
king of the Jews. <laughs> Blessed Jesus. And they raised that cross shaft. They, they raised the, 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 um, the, the, the piece that he was carrying, the cross beam. They raised it high and lifted him up after time and, and restricting him from moving to that thing. And it is said that the, the, um, the cross beam you know, was raised about 9 to 12 feet high from the ground. All right? And they would tightly bound the feet of the individual that they're crucifying or they would nail it to the board. No, can you imagine that? Your back, Jesus' back was, was badly damaged. His face was now a bloody mess as well. And here it is that they are restricting him even further by tying him and putting him in a cross. So even if Jesus wanted to wipe his face, he couldn't do it. Even if the sun was bearing down too much on him and he was being blinded by the sun, he couldn't do it. He couldn't do anything about it at all because he was now bounded to the point where he could not move his hands nor feet. But the, but, but the, but the wicked part, or even the worse than that, was that the Romans found a way to make it even worse for the victim, including Jesus. So they would put a, a, a piece of board, they would put a piece of board in the lower back or bottom of the individual, just such that it would allow the individual's body weight not to bear too much down on the cross itself, such that their body would be ripped apart and fall to the ground. But it would just be, be, be held up a little bit. Um, so all the body weight of the individual wouldn't just be acted upon by gravity just like that. Why? They did it that way because they wanted the person to live a little longer. Because crucifixion is not supposed to be a quick death. It is not supposed to be a quick death. It is supposed to be a very long and painful and difficult kind of death. It is supposed to be. And the Romans found a way to even make it worse by putting that piece of board such that the person's body weight would not be fully acted upon by gravity because that piece of board would actually allow some of the person's body weight to, um, to, to, to actually be encapsulated. So they would not just be like this by them, completely by themselves. So this is why when the Roman soldiers came just to check on the, the, um, the individuals, the Jesus and the two criminals that were on either side of Jesus. When they came to check on them, they found that Jesus was, was already dead. And they were surprised that Jesus was dead because they knew that this method that they have perfected of crucifixion is supposed to cause the individual to live longer and suffer more. So when they got to the place of the cross and they checked, they said, wait. This man dead already. Seriously, him dead already. But nevertheless, they wanted to make sure that he was already dead. So what they did was to take the spear and pushed it in his side. You know, we are fairly sure that he's dead. And we're surprised that he's dead. But we just want to make very sure because we will have to give an account to the governor that this man is indeed dead. So we want to make sure that he is dead. So they took the spear and pushed it in his side. Hence... From there now comes the blood and the water that fell from Jesus' side. Right? The fountain filled with blood that flows from Emmanuel's vein. Mighty God. That every sinner can plunge, mighty God, mighty God, and be cleansed of his guilty stain. That is the, the fountain that we're talking about in the song. That is the fountain when they took a spear and pushed it in Jesus' side and blood and water gushed out. Mighty God, blessed Jesus. Now, this particular act was supposed to cause the individual that was being crucified, saints of the living God, to suffer from mighty God, some kind of blood circulation, blood circulation um, problem, right? Because you're restricted and you can't move. No, I use an example to a previous, um, in a previous conversation. And I was saying, no, for some of us who have traveled before, right? You have traveled, I travel regularly. Let's say that you're traveling from Jamaica to England 
and that's like nine hours or 10 hours or so, right? You're traveling a very great distance and you're sitting in that plane in a very restricted position. So you have, you're seated, you know, right? You're seated in the plane and you can barely move your legs. You can barely move your hands and, you know, you want to get up and be free to walk up and down and to do whatever you want to do, right? You don't want, you don't like to feel so restricted and it is so frustrating for you, right? It is so frustrating. You're not bleeding. You're not sick. You're just sitting down, right? And you hate it. Now, we can imagine being beaten, a bruise, a, a abused, right? In so in such a way. And then your, your, your movement is restricted. Your hands are just outstretched and your legs are stretched a certain way and you can't move. You want to scratch. You want to, you want to wipe your face. You want to, you want some, you want something to drink and you can't do anything. And the sun is bearing down on you. Imagine how frustrating that is for Jesus. If you are sitting in a plane in AC, nice, comfortable seat, and you're still frustrated with the fact that you're so, your movements are restricted. Now, can you imagine what Jesus was suffering? And you're in AC, you know, and you're in a nice, cushioned, comfortable seat. But because your legs are not able to, out, to be outstretched as nicely, or you're not able to move around as you would, you know, normally, you feel very uncomfortable and uneasy. No, this man was on a cross like this. <laughs> blood gushing down his face, blood in his back and everything, right? And this man was at, at to the speed here in the hot sun. And you know, the Middle Eastern sun is like Jamaican kind of sun or worse. So the agony of the cross, ladies and gentlemen. No, this was supposed to cause, um, you know, blood circulation problems organ failure and even affixation right by virtue of the fact that the person's own body weight would cause them to experience these things no according to the according to the practice of crucifixion if the individual was on the cross for a while and suffering and when the roman soldiers come to check on them to see if they are dead if they are not dead then the Roman soldiers would then break their legs. How they broke their legs? They would take like a um, they would take like a, a piece of metal. Yes, a piece of metal. And they would hit their legs as hard as they can to break it, to break the bone in the legs. And by break the bone in the legs, that would send a shock throughout the entire body. From the legs upward, it would send a shock, which would further kill them. Because remember now, they would be in a state where they're half dead. They're half dead, right? But they're not fully dead. So what the Roman soldiers would do was to take a piece of metal and give them a good whopping such that it would break the legs. And by breaking the legs, that breaking of the legs would send a shock throughout the entire body, which would then further kill them. But when they got to Jesus, he was already dead. So because he was already dead, that action was no longer necessary. And that's why, the, and, and the Bible tells us that none of his bones were actually broken. See that? None of his bones were broken because it was, it was a prophecy that Jesus' bones would not be broken. So even though he was restricted on the cross, none of his bones were broken. And when they came to look at him, he was already dead. So they didn't need to go through that additional step of breaking the leg. Because he was dead already. And because of the Jewish custom that no person should be hanging on, the hanging on the cross until the evening, they wanted all of them dead and come down from the cross that they could be buried. Because if not, then that would cause um, a problem with the Jews. Because the Jews don't allow people not to be buried before a certain time. Right? So they didn't want that to be the case. So the, the, the Romans then had to come and check on the criminals who were on the cross, including Jesus, just to make sure, break their legs, finish killing them off before the day ends so that they can be taken down and buried. Because other than that, the Romans and the Jews would be at war because they are breaching um, the, the, the culture of the Jewish people. And that would be a problem. They didn't want that problem, so they would break their legs, finish kill them off, take them down, have them buried, and that's the end of that. And so that is just a synopsis 
just a synopsis. There's so much more that can be talked about that Jesus actually went through on that cross. And you know why he did it? He did it for you. As sinful as we were, as sinful as we are, he did it for you and I. When Jesus, before all of this, and he was in the garden, he understood the kind of things that he would suffer. He knew what he would suffer. And that's why he said, he prayed and he said, listen, Father, you know, please, if it be possible, take this cup from me. Take this cup because he knew what was actually going to come to him. And so he was very, as a human, as a human, the flesh didn't want to go through that kind of agony, but he did it for you. So why not praise him? Why not serve him this morning? Because he did it for you, just for you. He went on the cross. This is a love story as brutal and as horrible as I made it sound this morning. It is still a love story. Yes, because at the end of the day, you see the love shining through. He went to the cross just for you because he loves you. Mighty God, it couldn't be any other reason other than love why he went to the cross and suffered the thing that he suffered that you and I can have salvation, that we can have a part in salvation. The only reason why we are still in the land of the living is because he was crucified. He was lifted up, mighty God. The Bible says, if I be lifted up. And here's another misconception before we wrap this up. Oftentimes in our churches, we, we use the context that if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me, right? And we say that, and we take it to mean that if we praise God, if we lift up God in praises, right? Then he will draw all men. And while that may be true, that is not the context in which it was being said. It was being said in the context of Jesus' crucifixion. If he be lifted up from the earth, <laughs> mighty God, on the cross, that is, then he will draw because of the because of the actions of Jesus being on that cross and dying. Yes, on that cross. Men from far and wide, from all ages, even into 2024, mighty God, can receive salvation. So he will pull them unto himself because of that one action. It's not so much about just praising him by opening your mouth and saying, hallelujah, that draws men. It is not you and your praise that draw men. It is God who draw men unto himself. So if I be lifted up, meaning go on the cross and die, then he, mighty God, who died on the cross will draw all men unto himself. That is the context in which it's being said, not just praising so that's another misconception that we often put out there. And we're debunking these things this morning. Amen? Blessed Jesus. So when Jesus died on the cross, and the Bible said that the, the place was in darkness, and the veil in the temple was rent from top to bottom, which now signifies that we have direct access mighty God to God. We know of direct access. We no longer need Caiaphas with his corruption. We no longer need that high priest with his corruption. Yeah, being in the pocket of the Roman government. Being at the, the, the command of the Roman We no longer need Caiaphas. We can go now to God directly. But not only was that the case, but when Jesus went into the tomb, mighty God, this morning, and I'm wrapping it up this morning with this. So when Jesus went into the tomb, yes? <laughs> and he was laying there, mighty God, mighty God, mighty God, here comes the women. And I fail to understand why some people say that women ought not, mighty God, or women ought to be silent in church. Because who were the first one to, to go to Jesus' tomb? Even before Peter and John, mighty God, were the women, mighty God, the women went to, mighty God, the tomb, blessed Jesus, looking for, blessed God, Jesus. They went because they wanted to spice his body. Because according to their culture, they would spice, they would put spice to preserve the body of the dead. They wanted to spice the body of Jesus to preserve it. 
<laughs> mighty God. But when they got there, <laughs> mighty God, there was something else happening, mighty God. When they got there, mighty God, a blessed Jesus, an angel met them and told them that, listen, that he's not here. So they went back and told the disciples and the disciples ran and came to the tomb themselves to look. Mighty God, the stool was already rolled away. Jesus was dead inside of the tomb, yes? But he did not need an angel to move the stone away, to roll the stone away. He's God all by himself. He didn't need an angel. That's another myth that we sometimes propagate in church, that it was the angels that rolled away the stone. Mighty God, the stone was already rolled away and Jesus, is, Jesus was not in the grave anymore. He didn't need an angel. He could do it him all by himself. The angel were just messengers, just to tell mighty God, those who would come by, that he is not here. And today, there are still some people that are looking for the living among the dead. Mighty God, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Why are you going to the tomb looking for the living Jesus? Don't you know that on the third day, he would rise again? <laughs> Blessed Jesus, your God that you serve this morning is not a dead God as some may think that he is. Mighty God, Selassie died. Mighty God, and he's still in the grave. But Jesus is alive and well. Mighty God, he has gone to see of some. He has gone out of the grave. He came out triumphantly. It is said by some theologians that when they looked inside of the tomb in which are the place in which jesus body was laid they saw the napkin that was over his face because according to the culture they would put a napkin over the face of the dead body they said that when they looked inside they saw the napkin neatly folded and put down and rested on the place where his body was neatly folded and put down it is said by some i'm putting it out there like that so i'm not speaking as though it is some kind of factual thing but i'm just saying it is said notice the words i'm using it is said that way that it was neatly folded and put down on the place in which on the platform on which he was his body was actually laid no it is said again that according to the jewish custom and culture that if you go to somebody's house in, the, in those days and you are dining at that person's house and you enjoy the accommodation and you enjoy the food and the company and everything else and you want to indicate to that householder that you're coming back, then you would need to fold the napkin and rest it on the table. And that would give an indication to the individual who is hosting you that you're coming back. And it, so it is said that when Jesus, that when the, the napkin was neatly folded and rested in that tomb and they looked and they saw it, they understood what that meant, that he was coming back. <laughs> Blessed Jesus, he's coming back. He's not dead and he's coming back. What is he coming back for? And who is coming back for? He's coming back for blessed Jesus' church, the spotless church. He's coming back for every man or woman that confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord and is baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. He's coming back for those who are walking in righteousness, who are coming, who have come under the authority and control, not of the Roman government anymore, but under his heavenly control. That's who he's coming back for. He's coming back. And there is evidence to suggest that he's coming back. The, 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 the mighty God, the scriptures are littered, mighty God, with verses that tells us that there is coming a day when the mighty God, when the eastern sky will be broken, mighty God and blessed Jesus, the very God that we're worshipping, will appear in the sky, is coming back, saints of the living God. So what manner of men and women ought to be, mighty God, understand the agony of the cross that he had suffered just because he loves you and he's not going to love you to go to the grave and Stay dear. He loves you enough, mighty God, because he wants you to be where he is, wherever he is, he wants you to be. So he's coming back to take you to be his bride and for you to be with him. So he's coming back. So saints of the living God, this morning, I hope you have a little better understanding of what this crucifixion thing is all about. That we may learn to truly appreciate the sacrifice of Jesus. 
And while in this season, we have this culture in Jamaica where it's all about bun and cheese. That's nonsense. That's only something that we, 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 we push in Jamaica. It's just, a, a, um, it's just a way that corporate Jamaica find to make some money. It's just for corporate Jamaica to make some money. How does bun and cheese relate to these activities? The death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Explain that to me. Explain how does bun and cheese relate as any dealings with what the scripture says that happened to Jesus in terms of his, 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 his crucifixion and his resurrection. It's just a way that corporate Jamaica find to actually pull some money out of us at that time, right? And this nonsense about Easter bunnies and, you know, this craziness that, that we invent and put forward. How does that even help us to even understand the agony that Jesus suffered? We find a way to commercialize even the most sacred of things, right? We find a way to commercialize it and merchandise even the most sacred of biblical principles and even the most sacred of biblical things. We find a way to, to make money off of it. We find a way to push the, 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 the nonsense instead of focusing the thoughts, therefore then. Instead of focusing our thoughts on the things that Jesus suffered, and what that means for us and our eternal salvation. What it means for us as human beings where we're focusing on the commercial aspect of things. So now people are willing to fight each other just to get the last bun in the supermarket. People are willing to curse each other just to get the, the, the last tin of cheese in the supermarket. Because that is what is important. Forgetting about the whole the, the, the entire story behind why we have this season called Easter to begin with. Forgetting about all of that. Because it has to be a commercial thing where we can make some money, we can capitalize on it, and we can push the nonsense forward. But saints of the living God, I do hope and pray that going forward in this season, we will appreciate the sacrifice that Jesus makes and praise him. So know that you know. Know that you know. I guarantee you don't need anybody to pump you to praise God. You don't need somebody to push you and to tell you what to say, to tell you to say hallelujah. Because you would have understood the kind of sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And what I said before now is just a synopsis of the bigger story so we're ending it there this morning saints of god because time is of the essence but i want us to focus our thoughts even for a moment on that sacrifice don't think for one second that it wasn't a sacrifice that jesus made don't think for one second that it was easy for him to do. Don't think for one second that he couldn't have called 10,000 angels or just speak a word and destroyed the enemies. Don't think for one second that he didn't feel the pain for things that you and I would do even in 2024. The lies that we tell no was paid for on that cross. The wickedness that we're currently doing and that we will do tomorrow and the day after that. He paid for it by the things that he suffered. He became sin for us who knew no sin, the spotless lamb. There was a concept in the Old Testament that is called a scapegoat. The scapegoat. And we use it popularly in our, in our language, right? But it came out of the Old Testament system where the sins of all the people of Israel would be put on a goat. And the goat would be led out of the city with all the sins of the people. Right? So they would hold on to the goat and cast the spell on the goat and say, listen, the, this goat know of all the sins of the people. Send him out of the city with all of the sin. Send him out. We don't want him in the city. Go out. 
So he takes it and he faces the judgment as a result. So it is that Jesus was our scapegoat. We are the ones who committed the sin. Just like the people at the time. They are the ones who committed the sin. What does this goat have anything to do with these people's sins? Yet still, the sins were cast on this goat. So Jesus became our scapegoat. In that, we are the ones who sin. But he is the one who is punished for our sins. So God bless you this morning, saints of the living God. Let us reflect on these words and give God a praise. We're going to pray at this time before we close. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. We're going to pray that we will remember the sacrifice in these times and glorify the name of the Lord for the things that he suffered for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We lift up your name, O God, this morning on high because you are worthy to be praised. Father God, as we reflect on your word, we come to understand or come to a deeper, mighty God, knowledge of the things that you went through just to, mighty God, to buy my salvation. Father God, I was nothing and nobody. Mighty God, I was just, mighty God, wood to be burnt in the flames of hell. But you changed my destiny by going on that cross and dying for my sins. So I thank you, God, this morning for what you have done, for the things that you suffered. Because I know, God, that I couldn't suffer those things. I couldn't save myself. But you did, Lord Jesus. So, Father God, I thank you, mighty Jesus, oh God, for what you have done this morning because, oh God, you turn, oh mighty God, the judgment around, oh God, and you gave us the opportunity, mighty God, just to, oh blessed Jesus, be able to lift our hands, oh God, just to be able to look to you, mighty God, just to be able to have a relationship with you this morning, God, you give us the opportunity, blessed Jesus, to experience life and life more abundantly. So, God, this morning, we thank you. And we thank you, mighty God, even for your people that are afar off this morning, who have not yet seen the glorious light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Will, oh God, experience that light, oh God, as we continue to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ, mighty God, and mighty God, the things that you have done for us, oh God. At, at some point, oh God, they will hear about Jesus Christ. At some point, oh God, they will have their own understanding and revelation of who you are, mighty God. As mighty God, we come into that space, oh God, God, I pray that you will continue to empower us and use us, almighty God, to tear down, oh God, the middle walls of partition between yourself, mighty God, and those that are in darkness, oh God, by preaching the word, the undiluted word of Jesus Christ. God, have your way, God, this morning in our lives as we continue to worship you and lift you up, almighty God, oh God, and just to praise you for your sacrifice, your one-time sacrifice, that is able to save all mankind. Jesus, have your perfect way in our lives as we go forward in the future with you as our guide and the author of our lives. Bless your people this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Blessed Jesus. Blessed Jesus. Blessed Jesus. Blessed Jesus. Mighty God. Goodbye, everyone. I trust that you will have an excellent day. As I said before, good. It's a good Friday, right? It's a good Friday. So I hope you have a good Friday, right? And it starts by you acknowledging the sacrifices of Jesus Christ and worshiping him, all right? See you on the other side of next week. God bless you. God keep you in Jesus' name. Goodbye, everyone.